On the fringe of a Munich airport lies the wreckage of an airliner, still smoldering from a crash in which 21 people were killed. Tragedy enough at any time. But in that plane were a group of young men who were almost the personal friends of millions. Manchester United, the finest soccer team Britain has produced since the war. And seven of them died in the crash. Ten others, as well as their famous manager, Matt Busby, were injured. Some so seriously that their lives hung in the balance. Busby's babes, as they were affectionately called, were on their way home from Belgrade when the disaster struck. They were on top of the world. Their three-goal draw with Yugoslavia's Red Star team had put them through to the European Cup semi-finals. They had high hopes of the English FA Cup. Now those hopes are snuffed out, like the lives of seven of their finest players. Matt Busby needed all the strength of character he had acquired in the Lanarkshire coal mines, not only to come back from the edge of death, but to find the determination to start all over again. We did a lot of getting over, and uh, it took a long time to do that. They're, they're an age 21, 22, and sadly, the, 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 the years ahead of them, and uh, it was cut down with this terrible tragedy. So uh, this meant a terrible thing to get over. Webster runs in and shoots. Hopkinson can't hold it, but Higgins tips it away. The team itself recovered more quickly. Manchester United contested the 1958 FA Cup final against Bolton Wanderers. And although they lost 2 nothing, they had re-established themselves as some kind of force in English football. You're talking about the father figure of, all, of most managers, of all managers, if you like. You know, to survive the Munich disaster was a miracle. And for him to come back from that and be the man he was, and the creation of the Manchester United teams and the dreams and the players they've had there, the development of their own young players, the purchase of the players, which means you're a shrewd judge of a player. Matt was a superb, good temperament, allowed players to play, uh, managed with a velvet glove, I think. I was a kind man, generous man, beautiful man. But everybody knew at Old Trafford who was the manager. Matt had that rare and priceless gift of making people love him. And players, very hard and awkward guys, would uh, be terrified of Matt's disapproval and terrified of letting him down. Uh, for instance, you know, you'd often see Pat Crer and uh, who wasn't really a cringer by nature, you'd see Pat uh, full of uh, apprehensiveness about the possibility that Matt wouldn't be too pleased with him. Matt was a very, very strong character. And not many people know, but you know Matt Busby, I've never heard Matt Busby swear. He never swore. And you know, you can, you can imagine what like in a, fo a football dressing room with 20 or 30 fo fellas. And sometimes Matt would come along the foot and he might have heard somebody and he'd walk in and like, tell you, the place would be like a cemetery. Nobody would speak, nobody would admit to doing anything like that. That was the strong character he was. He was such a great personality. Natural authority was important. The aggressiveness and physical intensity that make good players can also make them difficult to handle. It was really just his own personality. The way that he communicated himself. You couldn't copy it because it came from the heart. He worried about you. He wanted the best from you. He encouraged you. Players must be absolutely dead calm. But what entertainment they've all given. Best to Canelli. To Law. Five. And he was, he was a very, very tough man. Um, when I say tough man, not physically getting hold of you and say, you will do this, you know, you're not doing that properly or whatever. With his words, he was tough and very strong. And when I went on the field to play, if I was playing particularly badly, I couldn't get him out of my mind. I couldn't get him out of my mind, like thinking, he's not going to be pleased with this, eh? If I wasn't doing well. If, I, uh, if I'd played well, I was thought, oh, well, maybe I'll get the nod of approval today.
he was in the hearts of the minds of the players. He got into them, uh, which is something that you can't learn. It's some gift that you're actually given. The gift worked even with George Best, maybe the most lavishly gifted player in the history of British football, but with a temperament inclined to self-destruct. George, George Best, he this tremendous talent, tremendous ability. And uh, he, he, now and again, he used to say, I used to say, sitting there, uh, Dennis Law would be in a good position, Bobby Chandler would be in a good position, and George would pick it up and I'd say, give it to Dennis, give it to Bobby, give it to... And he'd go on and, be, and he'd lose it. And I'd say, oh, my God, when is he going to get learned some sense? Not in that vocabulary. But uh, five minutes after, the same situation would happen. And George would go along and send this fellow the wrong way and that fellow the wrong way and say, put it in the back of the net. And I thought to myself, man, this time you'll keep your mouth shut. Yes. With McCready and McCready's made a catch. And it's a magnificent goal. Yes. It was a great, great uh, feeling to have these lads around because they're not only great players, they always uh, give you a great deal of respect to. Right behind Manchester United, and is it going to go? Charlton in the middle, so to his Aston. Charlton, another! He's got another! When Manchester United beat Benfica to win the European Cup, the euphoria was understandable. Many people felt that a tragic plane crash had made the presentation ten years overdue. Matt Busby and his players had overcome more than opponents to bring the cup to Manchester. I think he is Manchester United. I think that's the main contribution because there was nothing. When you look at the stadium outside there now, there was nothing here in 1945-46. A bombed out shell. And look at it now. What he set out for Manchester United to be uh, communicated itself to me, communicated itself to the players, and it's communicated itself to the people that have followed, which is uh, a great tribute. And nobody at this club underestimates what his contribution was to, to Manchester United. He's in the brickwork. I don't think I'll ever lose the appetite for it. There is that love for the game, and you want to see the game, and you want to see the outstanding players playing, and you want to see the, 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 the best team win. I, I, I feel it. I always want to see the team that gives, uh, reveals the talent to be the winners at the end of the day. So Neil, best. Oh, yes! Anyone who couldn't see uncompromising integrity in Bill Shankly's face couldn't see. He had a passionate commitment to the importance of the game and what it meant to its supporters. And it was uh, in the closing stages. And uh, Matthews was having a birthday that day, you know, as you could do against anybody. And he, he had beaten uh, one of his opponents in the far side. And I was making a beeline, of course. I was a sweeper up as well, long before they talked about sweepers up. So I was making a beeline for Matthews uh, when, as I got past the faraway post, he hooked it over my head. And Tommy Lawton came in, and he lashed it in the net with his head. And I could, I, I remember the, the noise the ball made, swishing against the wet net, you know. And he said, get in, you know, and I heard him, I heard him saying this. And I thought, a, a lump of cement had fell into my stomach. Yeah. And the net was swishing with noise, you know. Bloody awful it was. Terrible, terrible sensation. But a gunner would have shot him. <laughs> Bill was a vastly different man from Matt Busby, but... They did have quite a lot in common. For a start, Bill was also capable of making players love him and justifying the old uh, uh, corny line about uh, making men willing to die for him. Uh, he also had great judgment of, uh, of the basics of the game. He knew when people could play and when they couldn't play. <laughs> he had a habit of telling those who couldn't play in fairly dramatic terms. 
Like, I'm told that after he had bought Tony Hately for about 90 grand or something like that, he saw him out in the training ground, called him over and said, here, big fella, he said, have you ever seen a ball before? He just paid a fortune for him, but that, that didn't prevent Bill from throwing in the hard line.